film began just by capturing an, an image and it was exciting just to see the image. And at that time, the discovery of silver halide crystals, mostly silver halide and silver bromide together, would, would create an image that we could see. And the first uh, motion picture is reviewed in a kinetoscope. And the kinetoscope is a, an upright box that you look into the top, there's a 50-foot loop of film that plays, and, uh, and, and you see a little movie, uh, 50, 50 feet of it. And uh, you'd put in a penny, and it was battery controlled. They would throw over a switch, and you get to watch that that film. A little light would come on. Uh, now this is all very early. We're talking about 1896 to 1900. Okay, in about 1915, right around there, there used to be the uh, Cooper Hewitt lights that did all the filming. Uh, where they got the lights was from mainly uh, theatrical use. Uh, General Electric. Uh, a group of people were asked to design a, a light that was very powerful, and this is right around uh, World War I, and the use of that light would be for blinding the enemy. And then when Granddad left General Electric Company, he came on to uh, uh, Hollywood here and worked in the studios at MGM for several years to go ahead and find out what kind of equipment they needed to go ahead and light the sets. The first 35 millimeter motion images were on a cellulose nitrate base. And the interesting thing about cellulose nitrate base is that it decomposes over time into a rather obnoxious powder, but it's also highly flammable and it can, it can burn just like that. So the challenge is, is to be able to run it through a camera or a projector, you have to know what you're doing because if you have a spark or you have some other kind of contact that could create a spark, you could end up setting that film on fire and it burns very, very quickly. They could explode. As a matter of fact, the Fox, the, uh, the Fox Studios practically burned down because their nitrate bins caught on fire. Uh, they also disintegrate and, and turn vinegary uh, with age. When you're seeing an old film and it's, it's moving around, uh, it looks jittery. Uh, realize that these original films were, were shot to be incredibly beautiful. They weren't shot to be distracting, and certainly the frame moving left and right or up and down is distracting. That's primarily because this early uh, film, over the years, uh, the nitrate shrank. And when it went to be transferred, it was literally flopping around in that transfer gate. So um, the scratches occurred for several reasons. One, in the very early films, they used the negatives themselves to project in order to edit. When, when you run a, a negative through the projector over and over again, you're going to get scratches. And uh, that's one of the reasons that they're scratched. Another reason is you're looking at a dupe of a dupe of a dupe, because they would run these prints over and over and over again until they literally fell apart. So you're looking at not what the viewers of a silent film in the teens and 20s looked at, but you're looking at something that's um, uh, been degraded simply by its own use and its own popularity. The turning point for making this more viable for catching motion imaging and to make it look like something that someone else might want to see was to make the silver halide crystals themselves more sensitive to light in the way that the eye sees them. And the first films to do that were our orthochromatic films. The reason for the heavy makeup that was used in movies in the late teens was because the film's sensitivity was only to blue and green light, and it was insensitive to red, colors of red. And flesh tones have a lot of red in them. And as a result, they end up looking rather washed out and pasty is a word I've often used. This camera um, had a fantastic history. This is actually the evolution of the Lumiere camera. And this camera is capable of doing practically everything that a brand new Aeroflex or Panavision camera can do today. It's simply that it's uh, not convenient to use. And obviously, it can't run at a crystal controlled speed when you're using a crank. Now let's talk about the movement that's going on in here. Um, these are the two pins that actually pulled the film down. I'll try and run it slow enough and get out of the light so that you can see it happening. You'll notice there's a bubble level on the camera. Very useful, so that your horizon isn't out of level. This is the focusing device right here. And uh, you could use a grease pencil to mark if you were doing some sort of rack focus. This is your shutter angle. That's 180 degrees. That's 90 degrees, 45 degrees, and then close. 
Here we see the shutter, the lens, and the movement of the Pathé camera. This moves up, then this piece goes down again, and it goes into the film, grabs the film, pulls it down, and it does it over and over again. Okay, the breakdown is we have a, a positive carbon and we have a negative carbon right here. And when they come together like that, and then a flame happens, and then you have a flame that's produced like this, and all the light's coming out of the center of that carbon right there. These carbons, the positive carbon, lasts for about 30 minutes. And then if you didn't time the scene, you had to change your carbon in the middle of the scene, you would, you'd be in uh, pr pretty much trouble there. They're very safe. They're DC power and you can run them in the rain, you can stand out, we've had them out in the water, on, on stand, stand right in the water there with DC power and you can't get, you can't get hurt. AC is where the problem comes in. In those days, it's the brightest thing you can have next to the sun. The Bell & Howell 2709. Um, some of the amazing features of this camera are variable shutter, which you can actually see right here in this little window. It tells you the degree that your shutter is. This camera also has an amazing innovation. That innovation is the turret, the multiple lens turret. All you have to do is pull this and you can rotate the turret and go to a new focal length. Fabulous, what a great idea. This is the type of camera that uh, was used almost exclusively in the uh, Harold Lloyd films. There's a reason for that. This camera was uh, perfect. It, it would absolutely give you a pristine, beautiful image, and uh, every, it was completely in registration, whereas a Pathé camera had no registration pins, uh, and there was room there if the camera weren't adjusted properly for the film to actually move slightly in the gate. And that would cause warble, and that would really ruin the, uh, take, take the viewer out of the movie when they were watching it. This camera had no such problems. This camera lasted until uh, the early to mid-20s when the Mitchell camera took over. You know, if you've ever seen a photograph of the, uh, early cinematographers, you might have noticed that there were two cameras side by side. The reason for that wasn't necessarily to do double coverage on the action, but was primarily so that a negative could be used in the United States, and then another negative shipped to Europe. Uh, because it was cheaper to manufacture the prints in Europe for distribution there than to manufacture them in the United States and ship them over. This is a 10,000 watt bulb right here, which they used years and years ago when Harold Lloyd was around. And what you see in this bulb too, I just want to say one thing, these incandescent bulbs before quartz lights came out, the bulb when it was burning, it would produce a black covering on the inside of the bulb, therefore you would lose color temperature and light output, and you have to have this graphite in here. And the 10,000 watt bulb went into this fixture right here, which had a 20 inch lens, and that's the bulb when it sits inside there, how it works. And uh, I could probably turn. All right, we're gonna turn that on right now. Watch your eyes. And that's 10,000 watts. I can guarantee you, with the heat wise and everything else, that's 10,000 watts of light, I'm stepping out of it. Film advanced quickly. By the time Harold Lloyd was making Speedy in 1928, filmmakers were using panchromatic stock, pan meeting all colors. That revolutionized the motion industry again, because now cinematographers finally had a product that was sensitive to light that the eye sees. So it meant that makeup could change, set design could change, and the film emulsion itself was much more sensitive to light, was faster. So that gave cinematographers an opportunity to catch tones they had never been able to catch before with a more realistic appeal to the audience. All right, start your cameras. Hey. All ready, action. In reality, the job of a cinematographer today is quite a bit easier. Uh, you know, in the early days, you couldn't see through the camera. Um, you were dealing with very slow and contrasty motion picture stocks. Uh, today's motion picture stocks are incredibly forgiving. These, these men uh, were, were highly skilled, very talented, 
And, you know, they only got usually one shot at it. And to look at these early films and go, my God, how in the world did, were they able to envision, without seeing a rehearsal, climbing up, you know, the side of a building, Walter London, for example, amazing craftsman, uh, the beautiful images that he created, and all of it, he was not looking at what was being photographed. He was actually looking at some sort of viewing tube on the side, or more often than not, he would frame it up and then just watch the action as he was cranking. Uh, it's, it's very seldom that you actually see a cameraman hunched down looking through the tube. Ordinarily, they view it up, and then as they're watching, you know, they just watch. They know what their field of view is, and they know whether or not a person is going in or out. Filmmakers were, tr were wanting to introduce color into the films that they were making at that time. There were a couple of ways to do that. You could physically take film and put it through a bath, and have a color created from it. Could be red, could be blue, could be lavender. Sienna, sepia tones were all popular at that time. To continue working with color, in the early 1930s, Technicolor ran some early, very early tests of their process on Harold Lloyd's estate, Green Acres. The lights that you see around me here were mostly used between 19, I would say 29 to 1936. You know, I've been around all these lights all my life. Of course, I wasn't around when they built these, but I've gone through the museum of the company, looking at these lights, reading about these lights, and then uh, dreaming about someday that I would work here at the company when I got older. And I've been here since I was 17 years old. I've been here 46 years. You have to remember, from 1927 all the way up through the, these days, every movie ever made here in the United States has been made with Mo Richardson lighting equipment. All these lights right here. We, we have a distinct advantage over cinematographers in the past because we're going to use uh, a modern day film stock, uh, Kodak's Vision 2, 250 daylight speed film, which is a, a miraculous film with extremely fine grain. We're going to run it through one of these uh, antique motion picture cameras, a Bell & Howell 2709. We're going to hand crank it, and uh, we're going to have a look at what, what it would be like to, for a cinematographer of years gone by to shoot today with the old machinery but with the modern film stock. Let's build the camera. This is the Bell & Howell 2709 camera. This main shaft. There we go. That all looks good. Off we go. If you want to step right over here, step a little closer to that curb over there for me. Great. OK. That's a good place. OK, we're rolling. Now hold on. Stop there. Turn around for me. Step back to your original mark. Step back. There you go. Very nice. Okay, this is about 16 frames. Yeah, so just do that a few times. Come out and go back a little bit. You may be coming out of focus slightly by coming in that plus. You could be coming out of frame, actually. But. Okay, spin around for me, 75. Spin around. And fading to black. There we go. Now I'm gonna fade back in. There you are. Turn around. Good. Go back. Good. I'm going to fade out to black. Give me that curtsy again. Ready? And fade into black. And there we go. So to be a cinematographer in that era, or director of photography in that era, you really needed to be a very skilled photographer. It's a very sad thing that uh, the majority of these people are, are now gone. And um, it's uh, through efforts such as yourself and myself trying to preserve this knowledge and history so that people in the future who are working in the purely digital arena uh, will appreciate the, the type of effort that it took in order to create a motion picture in that era.